Praise God. I'm excited. Can y'all tell I'm a little fired up? One of the reasons that I'm fired up is because of the special guest that we have with us today at Redeem Life Church. This is a man who I look up to. It's a man who's embraced our church, who's embraced me and my wife. Him and his wife and his church have just been so instrumental in seeing us feel welcomed in the city of Azusa. It is Pastor Rick McDonald of Azusa House of Prayer. A man of prayer! You guys wouldn't even believe. A man who consistently prays for our church, who consistently prays for our city, who has been praying for us before we were even in this location. So I want to give this man of God some kingdom honor. And this is what we do. I know you're in your spaces and your places. You're in your homes. Perhaps if you're in your car, don't worry about standing up because you can't. But if you're able, will you go ahead and just stand to your feet and will you go ahead and give God glory for this man's life as we welcome Pastor Rick McDonald to teach the word. Well, it is an honor to be here this morning. Um, I've said this before, so I feel like a, a broken record, but I love your pastors. Um, <clears throat> they are awesome. Um, their life exemplifies the life of Jesus. And uh, that's, <clears throat> to me, that's everything. Um, I saw that the summer theme is uh, summer jams. And... So you're looking at the guy who uh, was part of the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s. So um, my summer jam is probably um, Good Vibrations and the Beach Boys. Um, maybe even Sweet Judy Blue Eyes by Crosby, Sills and Nash because of my blue eyes. But um, we are, I'm so honored to be here today. I'm so blessed that I have a wife that uh, has walked this journey with me for... Um, our 46 years of marriage, and uh, she is, while I'm doing this here, she's teaching and leading um, our daily prayer set um, over Zoom, and it's just great to be here with you. And, and can I just say, I'm here today as a citizen of a kingdom that can't be shaken. I'm, I am not, I'm not, you know, the writer of Hebrews says that we are part of a kingdom that can't be shaken, and that's our hope. And Paul tells us in Romans 14 that that kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And that's the kingdom we walk on. And so um, I want to share with you something that's been on my heart for a lot of years. Um, my church, my family will tell you that I'm, I've always felt like part of my call is to prepare the church, the bride of Christ, for the return of Jesus. Um, because the Bible says um, that the bride has made herself ready and that the spirit and the bride say come and that Jesus is coming for a bride without spot or wrinkle. And so um, in, in Matthew 24, and I could teach on Matthew 24 every day for months because it is so deep, it is so rich. In fact, when I was in college, um, I had a friend challenge me. He said, spend every day in the red. And so I spent four years reading all the red letters in my Bible, just reading the words of Jesus. If you have a red letter Bible, we used to say, read the red, pray for the power. And, um, and Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I believe, is the Constitution, the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights for the church. If we would live, I love today, before the service began, they were, they were beating out the Beatitudes. Um, that, is, that is who we're called to be. I tell people all the time, if you can live a Sermon on the Mount lifestyle, you will be powerful for the kingdom of God. Um, but in at the end of Matthew, so Jesus taught at the beginning of Matthew, at the end of the Matthew is a second powerful sermon. And it was actually a teaching based upon a question his disciples asked. In Matthew 24, verse 3, it says, As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Now, these things he was talking about, if just in verse 1 and verse 2 of Matthew 24, he had taken them to the temple in Jerusalem. And he said, a day is coming where this building will be shaken and not one stone will be left unturned. And so that got the disciples' attention going, okay, when's this thing coming? 
um, because they obviously, as you and I would do, they want to be prepared. They want to have whatever ready. But the, one of the great signs of leadership is, is not answering the question people ask, but it's answering the question they should have asked. And, and so Jesus didn't answer the question of when. In fact, he goes on and says, look it, the angels don't even know when, guys. That's not the issue. What he said was he didn't give them a date. He said, be certain that you're not deceived. He says that three times in Matthew 24. He didn't say, watch out for a pandemic disease. He didn't say, watch out for disaster. Watch out for destruction. He was talking in the life of the church be certain that you're not deceived. And he goes on to tell us that in this day, in this generation, that quite possibly even the elect will be deceived. And so he sits the disciples down, he walks them through these convergences that will come, and he gets down and he talks about the gospel of the kingdom. And, and he gets down toward the end of Matthew 24, and obviously he wasn't saying, this is Matthew 24, let's get to verse 32. He was just talking. And uh, he gives them a parable, and Jesus always instructs with parables. And so he says in Matthew 24, verses 32 through 36, and verse 42, he says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. Now this is the answer to the question, that the disciples had asked, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So the first thing he says is learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. So there he is answering their question. I don't know, the angels don't know, but here's what you need to know. He says, but my father only knows, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. So in this short passage, Jesus tells his disciples, there's three things, don't worry about the when. Don't worry about the when. He says, number one, learn the parable of the fig tree. Number two, know that his coming is near when the parable of the fig tree begins to unfold. And number three, watch. So what does he tell them to learn? Verse 32, of, of uh, Matthew 24, he says this, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know summer is near. So a fig tree, like any other fruit tree, loses its leaves in the winter. Its leaves begin to bud in spring and the figs become ripe in the summer. So when you see the, the leaves begin to sprout on the tree, you know that springtime has come. And we know that summer is near, that soon after these leaves bud out and these flowers bud, soon those flowers are going to become fruit. And so when the biblical signs of the times of the return of Jesus take place, he said it's going to be just like this fig tree. He said there will be a season where you won't see anything, then the leaves will begin to bud, and then look for the fruit that will come out of the leaves budding. So for, for them to function, that, that means the fig tree to function as a prophetic sign, biblical signs are going to make headline news. Um, and that's going to let us know it's a clear message from God. Fig trees, figs signal summer. Learning the events that signal the return of the king are obvious only if you're looking for them. So when people see biblical signs, they know he's on the move. So though it looks like winter and though it may look like it's dark, Jesus says, don't look at the season, look at the tree. Don't look at the weather, look at the tree. Are the leaves budding? Is the fruit about to come? Because the sign of the summer harvest is about to appear. And so the signs of the time, Jesus says, are there to give us encouragement that the return is near. 
So, and here's what he says, and this is very important for us to understand. There is only one generation of God's people that will see these signs come to fruition. One generation. Of all the generations from the time of Jesus, 2,000 years, depending on how you put forth a generation, there have been a lot of generations since Jesus ascended to the Father. But he said one generation will see these signs and one generation will experience the return of the king. And he said, now here's what he said the signs were. The sign of the fig tree, he said, these are the types of signs that you look for. And it's a convergence. When he says these signs, if they're not sequential, they're not A, B, C, D. All of these signs are going to happen at the same time and intermittently, and they will increase in intensity. And here's the signs he said in, in, in Matthew 24. He said, deception by false Christs and prophets. And this word Christ, it's a little c, not a capital, and it literally means anointed ones. There are going to be anointed ones who are going to come and speak to the church, and they will deceive the church. Understand, prophetic words, anointed ones, are not sent to deceive the world because the world's already deceived. They're sent to deceive the church because the last thing the enemy wants is a church that understands its identity, that walks in the fullness of the power that's been entrusted to us with the Holy Spirit, and we are able to stand in the midst of the onslaught. He says there's going to be ethnic conflict. He says there's going to be economic warfare in verse 7. In verse 8, he says there'll be famines and pestilence and earthquakes. I mean, last week we had an earthquake in the northeast it was a magnitude of five it was the largest earthquake in over a hundred years there's going to be hatred of believers verse nine relational breakdown in society families are going to be divided they're going to be contending against each other there's going to be lawlessness there's going to be an increase in sin and rebellion there are going to be fearful sights. There's going to be great signs in the sky and disturbances in the sea. Some of these convergences have always existed. We've had earthquakes, we've had wars, we've had pestilence. But we're talking about a magnitude that is so great that it becomes the headline of the news and the entire globe is watching. All of the nations are being affected by these convergences as the last generation begins to prepare for the return of the king. So he tells us to learn the parable. Then he tells us, he commands us to know that when these signs begin to take place, his return is near. Verses 33 and 34 of Matthew 24. So you also... When you see all these things, and I've just given you a list of these things. When you see these things, he says, know that, the near, that it's near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. And there's a lot of people that want to apply that he's talking to the disciples, so he's talking about that generation. No, he's talking about the generation when these signs begin to unfold. When all of these false Christs and false prophets, these deceptions, these uh, famines, pestilence, hatred of believers, ethnic conflicts, when all that takes place in that generation, that generation should know it's time to begin to look up because it was the generation that would see the fulfillment of all these things Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24. So this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. In fact, if you read Matthew 24, it says all these things must happen. I tell people all the time, don't pray against what's going on because Jesus says they must happen. And he says, when they happen, he says, the end is not yet. Because there's some other things that have to happen. But he talks about this generation, and, and I want to spend a lot of time delving into this. But in the Bible, there's a, there are three different time spans that are called generations. There's 30 years, 40 years, and 100 years. Um, we know the 40-year generation when the children of, of Israel were um, scared of the giants in the promised land, except for Caleb and Joshua, that God said, okay, that's it. This, this generation 
who was not brave enough to go in and conquer what I promised to them is going to have to wander in the wilderness and until they all die out. It says 40 years, they all died out, and the next generation came in. But when God talked to Abraham about the promise of who he was, about his inheritance being the stars of the sky, he told him this in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 16. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, at where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. And that prophecy was fulfilled. The, the, Israel was in captivity to Egypt for 400 years. Then he says, in the fourth generation, they will return here. So here we have a generation being 100 years. And so we're going to recognize uh, the end coming by the intensity in the generation that culminates with his return. Now, I am not a person who tries to take scripture and make it fit to my opinion. That's not, you know, the Bible is the best interpreter of the Bible. So what I'm going to share now is my opinion, so it's not scripture. I don't want you to put the two together. But in my view, I think the last generation began on May 14th, 1948. That was the day that David Ben-Gurion of uh, the Jewish Agency and President Harry Truman um, established Israel as a state. It was the day Israel became a nation. And if you look at the turmoil in the world, because the Bible's very clear, everything focuses on the church and on Israel. So we can't just watch ourselves and watch what's going on. We must keep our eye on Israel. Israel is the key to so much. If you read Daniel, you read the book of Revelation, after this world peace and this one world, this global government and this global religion and this global economy is all settled in, Israel started its sacrifices in the temple again that's rebuilt on the Temple Mount. After three and a half years, the abomination of desolation takes place. And it tells us this, after the abomination of desolation, the nations of the world will converge on Israel. The Antichrist will pursue the saints. Those are the two keys. Why would the Antichrist pursue the saints? Because we have the truth. We're the only ones that can point to him being a liar and being false. So he wants to shut us up. And the nations will come after Israel. That's not even in the notes. That was for free. <clears throat> so Jesus says when all of this begins to take place, if you don't understand that it's coming and your hope is not in a kingdom that's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, you will succumb to fear. You will be overwhelmed by what is happening around you. He says this in Luke 21, which Luke 21 is Luke's version of Matthew 24. So in Luke 21, Luke records, it says, when Jesus says, when these things begin to happen, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. This generation, again, that generation, will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And then he says this, take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down, and the day come unexpectedly. So he's saying, if you're not looking at the signs, if you're not paying attention to the parable of the fig tree, you are going to be overwhelmed with fear and with um all types of emotion because you are not ready for what's coming and we don't need to be afraid of it we don't need to be fearful of persecution coming in fact jesus says in the sermon on the mount that we should rejoice and be glad for great is our reward in heaven so israel had the opportunity to know the signs of the prophets and to know when Messiah was coming. And Jesus in Luke 19, when he approaches Jerusalem, he says he saw the city and he wept over it. So Jesus is crying over Jerusalem. Why is he crying? And this is what he proclaims over a city, over an entire people. He says he saw the city, wept over it and said to the city, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which made for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. 
For the day will come when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, surround you, hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. And this is why. Because you did not recognize, you did not know the time of your visitation. The parable of the fig tree Jesus spoke so that we would know the time of our visitation. And understand this. The people of Israel had a few prophecies spread about, you know, about Bethlehem and, and about, you know, born of a virgin, but they weren't all spoken at one time by one prophet. We have all of the signs spoken to us by one person, and that's Jesus. So if he cries over Jerusalem for missing their visitation, for not knowing when he was coming, how much more is he going to weep over a church where he says, these are the signs to look for. And know when that happens to look up because your redemption draws nigh. And so the last thing he says is we have understand we have to watch in that hour and to embrace what is right and refuse what is wrong. That's back to the deception. We have to be biblically informed. If it's not in the book, it's not true. Yeah. This, is, this is it. We need to live our lives in this book. Um, I, I challenged some young people the other day. I said, have you spent as many hours in the word as you have on Netflix? Because let me tell you, Netflix is the grass. Jesus says the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God lives forever. So we need to be putting eternal truth into our heart. And part of the eternal truth Jesus has given us is the signs we are to watch for. And he rebu rebuked a generation for not discerning the signs of the times. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because they couldn't see the signs of who he was. They wanted other signs. And understand this, not once. If you look at, when you read the red, Jesus never said, here I am, I'm your Messiah. Jesus never once declared himself to be Messiah. 78 times in the Gospels, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. And here's the difference. Israel was looking for Messiah. They were looking for a new king. They were looking for a political leader. That's who the Pharisees were looking for. Jesus came and said, I'm God. I'm the son of God. I have come to give you spiritual freedom. And they didn't know what to do with that. And that's why they crucified him for blasphemy. They didn't crucify him because he said he was Messiah. They crucified him because he said he was the son of man. And if you read Daniel 7, everything Jesus proclaimed was already prophesied in Daniel 7. He's just pre repeating Daniel 7 over and over and over. And so as we prepare and watch what the Spirit is saying in Scripture and the circumstances of our life, we need to know the Scripture. Do you know there are over 150 chapters in the Bible that talk about the end times? I mean, not, not just hint at it, but talk about it. We put together a list of all, we, we have 13 page list of all 150 chapters and what they say specifically about the end of the age. Jesus wanted to make sure we knew. God wanted to make sure that the bride of Christ knew when the wedding was getting close so that she would make herself ready. Number two, we need to prepare for the circumstances. We need to be anointed observers that watch for the signs that scripture talk about, that watches this convergent. And, and we also need to be watching in our personal life. How is the Holy Spirit stirring you? There are many unique things happening in the same time. In the New Testament, and I'm not going to go over all these verses, um, but they'll be up on the screen. Ten times, Jesus exhorts us. Jesus exhorts us to watch and pray. Ten times that we are to watch and to pray. So it's not just watching and seeing what's going on. We have a responsibility. When the disciples in the Sermon on the Mount said, teach us how to pray, the first thing he said was, pray your kingdom come, your will be done. As we watch and pray and we see these signs, Jesus says these must happen, so our job is to pray them in, not to pray them away. 
We are to watch and to pray and say, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. All this mess going on in our nation and globally, we're to say, okay, Jesus, do what you're going to do. We're not to pray against. We're to pray for. We're to pray for what he is doing. And Jesus ends this portion of scripture talking about the days of Noah. He says, but as the days of Noah, Matthew 24, verse 36 to 39. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So as it was in the days of Noah, so it's going to be in the day that Jesus returns. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus' main message here is sometimes missed. The people in Noah's day could have understood what was going on. J Peter tells us that Noah, one of eight people who were rescued, was a preacher of righteousness. Scripture also tells us that it took Noah a hundred years to build the ark. So here you have Noah, a hundred years, a generation, preaching righteousness, building an ark where there is no water to, for a boat to float. They've never seen a boat this size. The signs were before the people in the days of Noah every day for a hundred years. Every day for a hundred years, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. The people on the earth heard the message of righteousness. They saw the signs of the ark and scripture tells us it wasn't until the rain came and the doors closed that they realized what was going on. We cannot be, Jesus says, make sure you are not like the people on earth in the days of Noah. When these signs are happening, when these signs are coming, know it's time to look up. Know that the end is near. Do not be fearful. Be excited. Be passionate. Pray it in. Hebrews 11 says this about Noah. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, and became the heir of righteousness. Understand, when Jesus told his disciples, no one knows the day or the hour except God, not of the angels, Noah didn't know what day it was going to rain. Right. Noah didn't know when the rain was coming. Noah only knew that he was to prepare this sign and to preach righteousness. And we can know the generation just as Noah did. And again, I believe we're in the midst of that last generation. Um, it's not supposed to catch us off guard. We're not supposed to go, oh, shoot. When did this happen? <laughs> it's going to come and it's going to get faster and faster and faster. And the main message that I have for you today is this. Seek relationship with the Father because only he knows. The only way to avoid deception is to know this book and to know the Father because he's the only one who knows, but he in his great love and mercy has given you and I all the signs of the fig tree to know what season we're in and how to prepare for it. Pastor Bonnie, you want to come? Amen, amen. Come on. Give it up for Pastor Rick. We knew he would bless your heart. And listen, if you feel like you're in that place where you're seeing those signs in your life and you want to embrace what's right, I just want to give you a moment. Perhaps you haven't actually turned your heart over to the Lord and you feel like, no, I feel like this is the time with all the distractions that are being removed right now in this season during COVID and, and being socially distanced from each other, that maybe this is a moment where you are seeing this in your life and you want to get your life back on track. I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes where you at quietly and just pray with me in the spirit that you are coming home and say, Father God, I admit that I am a sinner and have been living my life in ways that I thought were right. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness right now. I want to live my life for you. I admit my past, but I look forward to the future. I believe in Jesus Christ that came as your son and shed his blood on Calvary for me. Yeah. Through all these generations, for me specifically, he knows everything I've done and, and yet you accept me. 
I ask that you come into my life and I commit my life to getting to know you, reading the word, reading the signs, and having joy because I know my salvation is now with Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, church. Amen. Welcome. And I want to let you know that that's not just a prayer. There's a team right now, if you're watching in any of our social media channels, it's going to put up a link for the next steps of what to do next now that you're stepping into this. And you can email us personally as pastors. Team, will you put up our personal emails, mine and Pastor Anthony's. We want to walk these next steps and what that means for you in your life. You are not alone. We love you. Thank you for being with us today. We believe that you were here for a reason. And we're excited. And we say welcome home. Amen. We hope this message encouraged you. And if it did, would you please share it or tag a friend? Also, if you would like more information, you can visit our website at redeemlife.church. And if you want to give, you can also go to our website and press the give button. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you and make it a great week.